Ever think about how much our understanding of human genetics has changed? Like, even just in the last few decades. Yeah, it's remarkable. It really is. How much we've learned. So today we're going deep on a deep dive to explore just that. Looking at how what we know about genetic variants. Specifically, those related to neurodevelopmental differences. Yeah. How that knowledge has transformed over time. Yeah. We're going to be drawing insights from a really thought-provoking article by sociologist Daniel Navon oh, yeah. called Reiterated Fact-Making. I love that title. Explaining Transformation and Continuity in Scientific Facts. He is a good one. He uses some really compelling historical examples to show how scientific facts can be both deeply continuous yeah. and radically transformed. Yeah, how is that even possible? Right. Fact is a fact, right? Well, we're going to find out. Let's start with a pivotal moment. 1959. Okay. This is when scientists gained the ability to actually see chromosome abnormalities under a microscope. So it's like suddenly being able to look into this hidden world. Yeah. And with this newfound visibility came a wave of discoveries. Right. It's like, oh. Scientists identified dozens of chromosomal anomalies. And all of a sudden. Leading to a flood of new genetic facts. Right. Although we might not use the term mutations as much these days. Yeah. But it was a really exciting time. It was. A lot of discoveries all at once. So all this new knowledge was emerging. But as Navon points out, most of these newly discovered variants didn't have much impact outside of those specialized research labs. Yeah. Interesting. Why not? He calls this the conditions of possibility. Okay. The social, cultural, and technological factors that have to be in place for scientific findings to actually become something we act on. Right. It's not enough to just have the knowledge in the lab. In the 1960s and 70s, most people diagnosed with these genetic variants were living in institutions. Hmm. So even though scientists were identifying these variants, they weren't easily able to connect with families and communities. Right. Not see how they played out in people's everyday lives. Right. That must have really limited the research. Absolutely. There was one notable exception, though. XYY syndrome. Ah, uh, yes. XYY. Hmm. Also known as the criminal chromosome. Oh, right, right. Have you heard about this one? Of course. Yeah. This is a case where a genetic variant became a big deal because it was thought to explain something that was causing a lot of social anxiety at the time. Mm -hmm. Violent crime. Oh. Early research suggested a link between XYY and aggression, and that was quickly amplified by the media mm -hmm. and even made its way into court cases. Really? Wow. So a tiny genetic difference was being used to label individuals and predict their behavior. Unfortunately, yes. That's hard to imagine. This is a stark example of how social anxieties and biases can influence the interpretation of scientific findings. Yeah, absolutely. Further research actually debunked the link between XYY and criminal behavior, but by then the damage had been done. The XYY network kind of collapsed amidst all these ethical concerns. Like the variant got caught in the crossfire of this much larger social debate. So while XYY faded from view, there were a lot of other genetic variants that had been discovered around the same time. Right. What happened to them? They kind of remained obscure because the conditions of possibility, those crucial ingredients for a finding to really take hold, just weren't there yet. Okay. They were missing those key ingredients. Right. So the landscape of genetics research was pretty fragmented at this point. Yeah. But things started to shift in the 1980s and 90s. Oh, interesting. There was a major change. Okay. A confluence of factors created a fertile ground for some variants to become much more than just obscure research findings. So this brings us to a pivotal moment in our story. What were some of those key changes that helped reshape the landscape? Well, one big factor was deinstitutionalization. Okay. People with genetic variants were increasingly living in their communities. Not hidden away. Becoming more visible in society, interacting with a wider range of people and systems. So this must have created more opportunities for researchers to understand how these variants actually played out in people's lives. Exactly. Mm. And this coincided with the rise of powerful patient advocacy movements. Like the HIV AIDS activism. Especially those sparked by the HIV AIDS epidemic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. These movements offered new models and strategies for mobilizing around health issues. It was a real turning point. Yeah. Families and communities affected by these conditions were no longer passively waiting for answers. Right. They were actively shaping the research agenda, mm -hmm. demanding better understanding and support. It was a really powerful shift. And this is where the story of Fragile X Syndrome comes in. Okay. Because I know this was a relatively obscure condition back in the 1960s. It was. But in the 1980s, a remarkable thing happened. 
Oh, what happened? Well, we'll have to say that for part two. Uh, all right, cliffhanger. That's right. So Fragile X was still pretty obscure in the 1980s. Yeah, definitely. But then things changed. Well, a dedicated group of parents oh. and experts formed the National Fragile X Foundation, or NFXF. So what's important about that? It was a game changer, honestly. Yeah. The NFXF didn't just raise awareness. Uh-huh. They built a network that totally transformed okay. how Fragile X was understood, yeah. studied, and treated. So this network, yeah. it was crucial because it allowed them to secure funding for research, raise public awareness, and connect families exactly. for support and knowledge sharing. Fragile X actually became a model for understanding autism. Wow. It attracted a lot more research funding and yeah. attention. It went from... The NSF. Yeah. They even created a patient database okay. that let researchers conduct these larger, more comprehensive studies. So Fragile X went from this little-known condition to playing a key role in advancing our understanding of neurodevelopmental differences. Yeah. It's a powerful example of how it really is a well-organized network can completely change the trajectory of a genetic variant. And the NFXF's success, well, it inspired other groups oh, okay. to follow their lead. Yeah. In the 1990s, right. the International 22Q 11.2 Foundation was formed. So they were learning from that fragile X experience, right? Exactly. They yeah. saw the impact of strategic network building yeah. and they just, they replicated that success. Wow. The International 22Q 11.2 Foundation, yeah. they helped transform 22Q 11.2 deletion syndrome from a, from a rarely diagnosed condition yeah. into a well-recognized one. With its own specific guidelines and support systems? Yeah, exactly. It's inspiring to see how collective action can really drive progress in this world of scientific knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. These groups, they weren't content to just wait for answers. No. They took an active role in shaping the direction of research. And it brings us back to XYY syndrome. Oh, right. Remember how its association with criminal behavior uh, led to its downfall? Right, it became stigmatized, even feared. Well, thanks to the efforts of advocacy groups like AXYS, XYY has been completely reframed. Oh, wow. It's no longer viewed solely through that lens of criminality. So how is it understood now? It's now understood as a condition linked to mild neurodevelopmental challenges. It's like XY was given a second chance. Exactly. This shows how our understanding of a genetic variant can evolve mm -hmm. as social attitudes change. Right. And as dedicated individuals and organizations work to really shift the narrative. It's fascinating. But there's another important aspect to consider here. Okay. As these facts are uh, being yeah. remade, we also need to think about how the past continues to influence the present. Path dependency. Exactly. It's like those trails, you know, worn into a hillside over years of foot traffic. Oh, that's a great way to think about it. Even as new trails are being made, mm. people still tend to follow those old, well-worn paths. And in the world of genetic variants, those trails often shape our understanding yeah. and research approaches. Okay. Take, for instance, yeah. uh, something called ascertainment bias. Ascertainment bias. What is that? This basically means we tend to test for specific genetic variants, primarily in people who are already showing symptoms. Oh, I see. So we're only seeing a small part of the picture. Exactly. We might be missing important variations huh. uh, in how the variant expresses itself yeah. in people who don't fit that typical profile. So this bias gets baked into our knowledge base. Right. And the material resources we build around a variant uh, can further solidify its trajectory. Yeah. The tests we develop, the data we collect, mm -hmm. the communities that form, they all reinforce certain paths of understanding. It's like building a bridge across a river. Okay. Once that bridge is built, it becomes the main way people cross, even if there might be other uh, potentially better ways to get to the other side. That's a perfect analogy, and it's important to remember yeah. these path dependencies don't mean that change is impossible, right? but they do highlight the challenges yeah. involved in reframing these genetic facts. So we've been talking about all these networks, how they shape research and treatment and how people see themselves. Right. But what about those variants that haven't been mobilized? You know, That's a great question. The ones that haven't gotten that attention. Navon actually argues that there are countless genetic variants out there. Okay. But only a small number become what he calls um, meaningful facts. Meaningful facts. So these are... Yeah, the ones that have a real impact on people's lives. Okay. 
And the difference often lies in whether or not there's a strong network built around them. So it's not just about the science. Exactly. It's about who's paying attention, who's advocating. The resources. Yeah, what resources are available. A variant might be scientifically interesting, but without a network of researchers, advocates, and funding, it, it might never be fully understood or translated into something that can help people. That's what I find fascinating about all this. Yeah. It challenges us to think beyond just the purely scientific aspects of genetics. Right. And to consider the social forces that determine which variants get that attention and resources. Yeah, absolutely. What does this all mean for us, you know, non-scientists trying to make sense of all this genetic information? It reminds us to be critical consumers of information. Yes. Just yeah. because something is presented as... Uh, a scientific fact right. doesn't mean it's fully understood or that it will have the same implications for everyone. Yeah, we can't take these facts at face value. We need to understand the context in which that fact was produced, yeah. the potential biases involved, and the networks of power that shape its trajectory. And it highlights the power we have, yes, individually and collectively, to shape how these facts evolve. Absolutely. We can support research, engage in advocacy, push for more inclusive and equitable approaches. To genetic testing and treatment, yeah. And this brings us full circle to XYY syndrome. Oh, right. Back to XYY. Which started as this symbol of fear and prejudice. The criminal chromosome. But as we've learned, it's been transformed into something so much more nuanced and complex. It really has. And through the work of researchers and advocates, yeah. we've moved beyond that simplistic and harmful view. We now see it as a variant linked to certain challenges but not one that defines a person's fate. Exactly. This whole conversation has given me hope. Me too. That our understanding of these facts can evolve as we learn more and as we um, challenge those narratives that surround them. Scientific knowledge is constantly evolving. It really is. And it leaves us with a thought-provoking question. Okay. Yeah. What other facts that we take for granted today might be transformed in the future? Mm. And what role might we play in shaping how those facts evolve? It's like a call to adventure. It is. To become more engaged and form participants yeah. in this ongoing process of scientific discovery. It's a journey. Thanks for guiding us through this. Oh, of course. My pleasure. Incredible journey. I always find it fascinating to explore how scientific knowledge is shaped by social forces. Yeah and how we can all play a role in that process. Wait, to all our listeners out there, remember that these genetic facts are not set in stone. You're dynamic. They're dynamic. They're revolving. They're evolving, and they're influenced by the choices we make. Absolutely. So stay curious, stay critical, and stay engaged. You might just play a part in rewriting the story of a genetic fact. Until next time, deep divers. Yes.